Now I'm going to explain how we exploit instrumental variables to estimate unconfounded effects. I'll start by deriving a simple estimate that you can calculate by hand just to motivate how this works. In practice, we don't do this by hand. We use a two-stage regression model. I'll explain what that is in a bit. Before I can derive the estimate, I have to explain the concept of complier class. It's important to understand that instrumental variable analysis can only estimate effects for people we call compliers. Compliers are the people whose exposure is actually influenced by the instrument. In a randomized trial, this would just be someone who's going to do whatever the researchers tell them to. A non-complier is not influenced by the instrument. In a randomized trial, this would be someone who would take the control even if they were assigned to the treatment, or someone who would take the treatment even if they were assigned to control. You can call these never takers and always takers. There's also a third class called defiers. These are people who do the opposite of what's expected. For example, if someone with an inactive ALDH2 gene actually drank more alcohol because they liked the facial flushing, that would be a defier. Or if someone in a randomized trial would only take the treatment if assigned to the control group, or would only take the control if assigned to the treatment group, that would be a defier. You can see that these are very unlikely cases. In fact, in order to make our estimates, we actually have to assume that there are no defiers. That's usually a reasonable assumption. Note that complier class is often unobservable. Just because a control patient takes the control doesn't mean they're a complier. They might have taken the control regardless. So we can't usually identify these classes, but we need to understand them theoretically to derive our estimate. A really good example for illustrating the idea of complier class is the recent legalization of marijuana in California. In this case, we can actually observe the complier classes. Imagine that we want to use the legalization of marijuana as an instrumental variable for studying the effects of marijuana on health. Compliers are people whose smoking habits are actually influenced by the legislation. These are the people who didn't smoke when the drug was illegal, but will smoke now that it's legal. Non-compliers are those who are unaffected by the legislation. They either smoked when it was illegal and will continue to do so, always takers, or they didn't smoke when it was illegal and they still won't smoke now that it's legal, never takers. Defiers would be those who smoked when it was illegal but won't smoke now that it's legal. This is likely a rare case, but I guess it could exist. Maybe if you had teenagers who were smoking just to be rebellious or something. I want to point out that we could also have partial compliers. For example, someone who smoked before but is now going to smoke more now that the drug is legal, that would be a partial complier. In my derivations, I'm going to treat complier class as binary just because it keeps things simple, but in reality, complier class is more of a continuum. The instrumental variable analysis is actually quite straightforward. I'm going to derive it more carefully in a minute here, but I'll just give you a simple estimate right now. So if I wanted to get the effect of the exposure on the outcome, so in that PLOS pa one paper, they wanted to estimate the effect of alcohol on a particular risk factor for cardiovascular disease, which is blood pressure. I can get that by taking the quotient of the effect of the instrument, in this case the genotype, on the outcome, in this case blood pressure, and that's going to be an unconfounded effect and I can divide that by the effect of the instrument on the exposure, in this case the effect of genotype on alcohol. Notice my numerator is in units of the instrument. What is the increase in blood pressure for a one unit change in the instrument, in this case a change of genotype? That's not the units we want though. By dividing by this denominator, we are rescaling to get into the units we want. We want the units of a, what is the change in blood pressure for a one unit change in alcohol exposure, and our denominator provides this for us. To illustrate here, in that PLOS One paper, the effect of genotype on blood pressure was about a one millimeter mercury reduction in blood pressure, and I'm simplifying a bit here. There's actually three genotype groups, but I'm just going to ignore the heterozygotes 
and we'll look at just two groups for simplicity, the ALDH2 negative negative, they carry two inactive copies of the gene versus the non-carriers. The difference in blood pressure between those two groups was about a one point reduction in blood pressure. That's my effective genotype on blood pressure and then remember what was the effective genotype on alcohol? Well I told you that the mutant group drank 0.09 standard drinks per day, the non-carriers drank 0.90 standard drinks per day. So the effect of genotype on alcohol exposure was a 0.81 reduction in standard drinks per day. And notice that now we are in the correct units. This is the change in blood pressure per change in standard drinks per day. And I've written this out more neatly on this slide. When you actually divide this out, you get that the effect of alcohol and blood pressure is an increase of 1.2 millimeters of mercury in, uh, of blood pressure per one standard drink per day. So alcohol actually increases your blood pressure. All right, now I'm going to derive this more thoroughly. Don't be intimidated by this slide. There's a lot of things going on here, but a lot of this is going to cancel as I'll show you. So first of all, the effect of genotype on blood pressure is something very easy to get from my data. So this is the effect of genotype on blood pressure. How does the genotype affect the blood pressure? Well, that's easy. That's just the difference in the average blood pressure in the mutant group minus the average blood pressure in the non-carriers. I already showed you that that's about a uh, one point reduction in blood pressure. So this uh, equation is true, but then I can actually break down what are the components that affect blood pressure. And I can do that separately for my two groups. Imagine that I'm fitting a regression here where I'm predicting the average blood pressure in the mutant group as well as the average blood pressure in the non-carriers. What would all, all the components be that went into that? Well, uh, the average blood pressure in the, in the mutant group, there's going to be an intercept. That's just like your baseline blood pressure. And then I'm just calling this beta confounders, but imagine like all of the confounders and all of the things that are not alcohol that affect blood pressure. Everything non-alcohol that affects blood pressure. I'm just putting all of that into, imagine I've got a beta confounders here, which is just a vector of betas, which represents all of that. And then all of that's going to be multiplied that by the average values of those confounders in that mutant group. Um, we also have some contribution to blood pressure from the alcohol exposure that's unrelated to the genotype. So this is the alcohol drinking in the non-complier group. We're going to have some effect of alcohol and blood pressure in that non-complier group times all of the alcohol that that non-complier drink group drinks. And that's all the alcohol that's drunk for other reasons unrelated to genotype. And then finally, of course, we have the component of alcohol that's due to genotype, that's related to genotype. So that's the complier group. So this is the effect of alcohol and blood pressure in the complier group, and we would be multiplying that beta by the average alco alcohol intake in compliers in the mutant group times the proportion of compliers. Now notice that everything else is the same. If I look at the non-carrier group, pretty much everything is the same. So lots and lots of things are going to cancel. The intercepts are the same. That's going to cancel. Remember that we have assumed that confounders are completely balanced in the two genotype groups. So everything to do with confounding and other predictors of blood pressure is going to be assumed to be exactly the same in the two groups. Those elements are going to cancel. Also, we've assumed that compliers and non-compliers are exactly are going to be balanced also in those two genotype groups, as is the average alco alcohol intake due to factors other than genotype. So all of these things to do with non-compliers and alcohol all of that is also going to cancel. So what are we left with? We're left with the component of the effective alcohol and blood pressure in compliers multiplied by the intake in compliers. That's in the mutant group and we have, we're left with that same component, that same element in the non-carrier group. So that reduces down to this term. And then I've simplified this just a little bit more because we can just, isolate this term and that will be the effect of alcohol and blood pressure in compliers. It will just be multiplied by times the difference in average alcohol between the two genotype groups, which I've already told you is that negative 0.81 standard drinks per day. Well, what am I trying to get at here? So now I have this equation. I proved that this equation is true. 
What I want to isolate is the effect of alcohol and blood pressure. So that's now easy algebra to isolate that. So that's all I've done here is just to isolate that effect. Well, I've shown you now that that effect of alcohol and blood pressure in compliers is just, again, the effect of genotype on blood pressure divided by the effect of genotype on alcohol intake. So the negative 1 divided by the negative 0.81 as before. One important thing to point out here is notice that I have estimated the effect of alcohol and blood pressure in the complier group only. This has consequences. Notice that everything about non-compliers has been canceled out. Since the estimate is based only on compliers, the estimate may not be generalizable to non-compliers. We don't know if it applies to non-compliers. I haven't estimated it for them. I've canceled them out. Also, it's really important to recognize that because we are basing our estimate only on the variation in alcohol drinking that's due to genotype, we have a f only on the, in the compliers, essentially, we have effectively reduced our sample size. So that means in the instrumental variable, our instrumental variable estimate, it, the precision is going to be decreased. So let me show you that here. This is one of the tables from that PLOS One paper. It's a little bit fuzzy, but I'll just zoom in here. So the instrumental variable analysis came out with a 95% confidence interval for the effect of alcohol on blood pressure of 0.23 to 2.07. In that paper, they also just simply regressed blood pressure directly on alcohol exposure. So this is going to be a biased estimate. But that came out to have a 95% confidence interval of 0.34 to 0.65. That confidence interval is six times narrower than the instrumental variable confidence interval. So even though this estimate is biased, because it's based on the entire sample size, it's a much more precise estimate than the instrumental variable analysis where the sample size is effectively reduced. Now I want to talk about the use of instrumental variable analysis when you have randomized trials with non-compliance. In that case, your instrumental variable estimate, the numerator is just going to be the intention to treat estimate. So I'm going to use the example where we had the randomized trial of integrated care versus usual care in special needs children, and the outcome was psychosocial quality of life. The numerator for your IV estimate is the effect of the instrument on the outcome. Well, the instrument now is treatment assignment in the randomized trial. So the effect of treatment assignment on the outcome, that's the same as the intention to treat estimate. And in this particular study, it came out to be 1.5 points. Those who were randomized to integrated care had 1.5 points higher on this psychosocial quality of life scale than those who were randomized to control. Our denominator is going to be the effect of the instrument on the exposure. And so in this case, that's the effect of being randomized to the treatment group on the actual receipt of treatment. So how much did, how much more likely were you to receive treatment if you were randomized to the treatment gr group rather than the control? Well, it turns out in this study, 48% of those randomized to the treatment group actually received the integrated care versus 0% in the control group. The control group was not eligible. They had no opportunity to receive the integrated care, so we have 0% in that group. So the difference is 48%. So to get our IV estimate, we're going to divide the intention to treat estimate by the difference uh, in the proportions receiving treatment in the two groups. And notice we come out with an estimate here of 3.1. Notice also that as long as we have noncompliance in the randomized trial, if we do this estimate, the denominator is going to be less than 1, which means our IV estimate is always going to be bigger, farther from the null, than our intention to treat estimate. However, it's also going to be less precise. So in this study, they came out with an intention to treat estimate of 1.5. The confidence interval was negative 1.5 to positive 4.5. Compare that to the IV estimate. The effect size was 3.1, but the confidence interval was about twice as wide, it went from negative 3.1 to positive 9.3. So that reduction in precision, you can see that there in the confidence interval. And actually, it's interesting because when you think about a randomized trial with noncompliance, you might think, should I use an intention to treat estimate or an instrumental variable estimate? You might actually want to provide both. But it's important to realize that they're going to likely give you the exact same statistical inference. They will give you very similar p-values. 
And that's because the relative increase in effect size is almost exactly offset by the relative increase in the standard error. So you can see that in this particular example. For the intention to treat estimate, the effect size was 1.5. Coincidentally, the standard error happened to also be 1.5. That's just a coincidence. The IV estimate, the effect size was 3.1. And also coincidentally, the standard error was 3.1. So the relative increase in effect size is exactly offset by the relative increase in standard error. So for example, if I was going to calculate my z-score for my intention to treat, well, that's just going to be 1.5 divided by 1.5, or a z-score of 1.0. Well, that corresponds exactly to a two-sided p-value of 0.32. But I'm going to get almost the same z-score for my instrumental variable estimate. It's also going to come out to be about 1. Now, they actually reported a p-value of 0.33. So that means we probably have a little bit of a difference down in the decimal places. So these don't come out exactly the same, but they're extremely close. And in limited simulations that I've run, I've actually found this to be generally true. The, in, the relative increase in effect size is very close to the relative increase in standard error. So usually, there's little difference in the p-value in the statistical inference. It still might be useful to provide the instrumental variable estimate because it gives readers a sense of the potential magnitude of the causal effect of treatment. So you still might provide both, but it's unlikely to change the inference. Notice that I haven't told you how to calculate the standard errors for the estimates. This is because, in practice, we don't calculate these by hand. We use what's called a two-stage regression. We first fit a model to predict each person's exposure level based on their value for the instrument. And then we take these predicted exposures and we use those in a model to predict the outcome. So instead of using the actual exposures, we're now we're using the predicted exposures. So let me put an example to this. So go back to that example from the PLOS One paper. So in that case, you would first run a model where you predicted the effect of genotype on alcohol exposure. And then that would give you a predicted exposure that you could plug in to predict blood pressure. I can show you this. This gives us the same thing as our hand calculations, though, because um, this is a very simple case. And let's use the simple case where we have just two genotypes. I'm ignoring heterozygotes again. But we have the ALDH2 negative negative group. Imagine that you're dummy coding this, so you code that as a value of 1. And then you have the non-carrier group. That's your reference group, so we code that as a value of 0. And imagine we regress that on alcohol units. Well, I can tell you, because this is a very simple model, there is no confounders, exactly what the predicted values are going to be for those two groups. If you are in the mutant group, you're going to have a predicted value of 0.09 standard drinks per day. If you're in the non-carrier group, you're going to have a predicted value of 0.90 standard drinks per day. We're going to then plug that 0.09 or 0.90 into a model to predict blood pressure. Well, imagine that we had just directly fit a model to predict blood pressure with genotype as the predictor. If we had done that, again, we would have had just two values for the genotype, 1 and 0, to predict blood pressure. That would have given us a beta of this negative 1 millimeters per mercury reduction in blood pressure. Well, we're not doing something very different when we plug in the predicted values for exposure here, because there are only two predicted values. So instead of plugging in a 1, we're plugging in a 0.09. Instead of plugging in a 0, we're plugging in a 0.90. So all that does is it has the effect of taking this negative 1 and rescaling it by a factor of 0.81. So we're getting the exact same thing as we did before. The, the good thing, though, about two-stage regression, what it does that's more uh, interesting, more complicated, is that, of course, now you can incorporate confounders. So imagine you have a case where there is an imbalance in measured confounders in the instrument group. I told you that that's OK as long as you adjust for that, uh, and, you can, and as long as there's no unmeasured confounding after that. But uh, in order to adjust for those confounders, you have to put them into your two-stage regression. And you must put the same confounders in both stages of that regression, in both models. Another thing to point out is that 
you don't want to do this two-stage regression manually. You don't want to sit there and fit a model to predict exposure and then output those predicted values and then separately fit another regular regression model on those predicted values. You won't get the correct standard errors if you do that. You actually need to use specialized two-stage regression software to get the correct standard errors. Okay, so the validity of an instrumental variable study, you can see it really depends heavily on the validity of the instrument. So you have to check those assumptions that I told you about for instrumental variables. One thing you need to do is you need to verify that the instrument is indeed related to the exposure, and it can't just be weakly related. It has to have a sufficiently strong relationship with the exposure. If the instrument explains very, very little of the variation in the exposure, then our instrumental variable estimate is going to be based on very little data, and it's going to therefore be imprecise and unreliable. So you can imagine a case where take a randomized trial with non-compliance and you get a value of 1.5 for your intention to treat. If the difference in the proportion of people receiving treatment in the treatment versus the control group is really, really small, like imagine it's incredibly small, like 0.1%. This is a very, very small number that's going to effectively reduce our sample sizing to an incredibly small number and we're going to have a very imprecise estimate. Um, it's also going to be an unreliable estimate. But this assumption is something that's easy to check. You just can look at the exposure levels in the different instrument groups and compare them. You can also look at the R squared and F statistic from the first stage model in your two-stage regression. So this one's easy to check. A much harder assumption to prove is that the instrument is actually a good randomizer. That is, that it's not related to confounders and that it's not in any way directly related to the outcome. This is harder to check. Of course, you can check for balance in measured confounders between your instrument groups, but because unmeasured confounders are unmeasured, there's no way to check that those are balanced. You can only argue for a balance in unmeasured confounders on theoretical grounds. And this is the sticky point for instrumental variable analysis. Whether or not an analysis is convincing to me really depends on how much I believe that the instrument is truly a good randomizer, that it truly meets these assumptions. Researchers uh, should, in a good IV analysis, include a sensitivity analysis that examines the potential impact of plausible amounts of unmeasured confounding on the results. If there is some unmeasured confounding, how much might it have impacted the results? You can look at that. And don't forget, we've also implicitly assumed that there are no defiers. This is usually a good assumption, but it's something you'd want to at least think about as there may occasionally be instruments where this could be violated.